Welcome to the next lecture on modulation techniques for mobile communications. The brief outline for today's talk is as follows. We will first summarize what we have learnt in the previous classes. Then we will look at constant envelope modulation techniques. We will look at binary frequency shift keying or BFSK followed by minimum shift keying and then something which is used in modern GSM systems Gaussian minimum shift keying or GMSK. Finally, we will have a small glimpse at MRE PSK. So, this is the outline for today's talk. First a brief recap. Last time we learnt the linear digital modulation techniques and why they are better than analog modulation techniques. In particular, we talked about binary PSK or phase shift keying. Then we learnt that you can use differential phase shift keying in order to do the same thing without the use of the carrier. You cannot, you do not have to get the phase information to use DPSK. We then moved on to quadrature PSK or QPSK, one of the very popular modulation techniques. Then there were problems with QPSK because of the switching and there were possible switchings of 180 degrees in the symbols and hence we proposed another technique called offset QPSK which only allows a maximum of 90 degree phase shift between symbols. And then a compromise between QPSK and offset QPSK called the pi by 4 QPSK wherein we use not one but two signal constellations of QPSK uh, shifted mutually by pi by 4 and you use alternately each one of the constellation diagrams. Now, today we are going to focus on constant envelope modulation techniques. What are the advantages of constant envelope modulation techniques? First and the foremost is power efficient class C amplifiers can be used without introducing degradation in the spectrum. Please remember the basic requirements of any modulation technique is A the spectral efficiency, B the power efficiency and C how easy or difficult it is to design the receiver. Here you can have very cheap power efficient class C amplifiers that can be made use of for constant envelope modulation. The other important feature of constant envelope modulation techniques is low out of band radiation of the order of as low as minus 60 to minus 70 dB. So, really low out of band emissions which is very good because my receiver um, low pass filters and band pass filters do not have to be very strict. Then all this leads to simplified receiver design and high immunity against random FM noise and signal fluctuations due to Rayleigh fading. So, in general the constant envelope modulation techniques fare much better in the Rayleigh fading environment and hence a favorite choice of many wireless communication systems. First let us start with binary frequency shift keying or BFSK. Clearly we have one bit per symbol and we denote frequency 1 or FL lower frequency to send symbol 1 which is representative of say 0 and frequency FC plus delta F for bit 1. So, 0 is denoted by this symbol on the left and 1 is denoted by the symbol on the right. If you plot it a lower frequency represents 0 and a higher frequency represents 1. So, what is the modulator doing? Modulator is just a multiplexer where you have a select bit in and it chooses between S0 and S1, lower frequency and higher frequency depending upon whether the bit is 0 or 1 and sends it. Clearly there is a problem. The problem is the moment you switch the transitions may be abrupt and any time I have abrupt transition, abrupt phase changes. I will have 
out of band emissions, spurious emissions. This is bad news. So, suppose we take an example for binary FSK and the data sequence that I am trying to send is 1011001. So, 1 is depicted by a higher frequency, 0 is depicted by a lower frequency, high frequency, high frequency, low, low, high and so on and so forth. But the moment the symbol interval which is also the bit interval in this case gets over, you shift to the next symbol. But at the time of transition, you have phase discontinuities. Question? Yeah, question being asked is, can there be any fixed ratio between the higher frequency and lower frequency? The answer is yes, actually we need the higher frequency and lower frequency to be orthogonal in some sense. That is integrated over one symbol interval, the integration should yield 0 if I integrate v 1 t v 2 t. So, there will be some possible spacing. And as you have higher and higher spacing, you can reach a number of solutions. The minimum shift possible, which will still render it orthogonal, will lead us to a minimum shift King's situation. But here, in a very simplistic scenario, we are showing that we have two uh, symbols, one denoted by a lower frequency and one denoted by a higher frequency. Also, we can put in another constraint as to the phase continuity part, which we will talk about in the subsequent slides today. The point to be noted from this slide is that phase discontinuities will occur if we use a simplistic binary FSK modulator as shown in the previous slide and this is not acceptable. This is called discontinuous FSK. So, we have to work around this. This is clearly not an acceptable solution. The answer comes in the form of continuous phase FSK or also called CP FSK. Here the solution is simpler. We have a constraint on the number of cycles that we have and the continuity at the transition is maintained. So, there must be a relationship between the number of cycles here and a number of cycles here. Clearly, if you see the lower frequency has two complete cycles and the higher frequency has 1, 2, 3 and 4. This is logical. So, if frequency f 1 is twice of f 0, we meet this constraint. Even if we have the frequency f 1 4 times f 0, again the constraint will be met and so on and so forth. So, you can have as much separation between f 1 and f 0 as possible, but you are clearly interested in the minimum possible separation, because we do not want to be very expensive in terms of the bandwidth requirement. What we understand from this slide is, for the same data stream as discussed previously, I can have an FSK which is continuous phase. So, no phase discontinuities at symbol boundaries, hence continuous phase frequency shift key. Now, let us see what are the problems associated with phase discontinuities. Phase discontinuities pose several problems like spectral spreading and spurious transmission. Both are highly undesirable, especially in a regulated environment. So, we need a continuous phase FSK, something similar to analog FM, except the modulating signal is a binary waveform. So, if you remember from one of your previous lectures, you have an FM, which has the frequency proportional to the input signal. Here, instead of having a continuously varying message signal, we have a binary waveform consisting of 1s and minus 1s and we modulate the FM using that. So, this will ensure that I do not have phase discontinuities. So, my signal S subscript F of 
f s k t can be represented as under root 2 e b over t b, e b is energy per bit, t b represents the bit duration, cosine 2 pi f c t this is my base frequency plus this is the modulating signal and m eta can be binary plus 1 or minus 1. This will yield a continuous phase f s k. Please note even though m eta can be discontinuous, the integration minus infinity to t m eta d eta multiplied by 2 pi f k is not discontinuous. This whole thing will be a continuous phase signal. Now, how do we build a transmitter? A very simplistic transmitter is as follows. We have two modulators cos 2 pi f 1 t and cos 2 pi f 2 t pertaining to 0 and 1 and we have a binary data sequence coming in and we have an on off level encoder and then here we pass it through an inverter which will multiply it to cosine with f 2 as a frequency, the other part is f 1, add it up and send it out. So, it is a clear implementation of the uh, formula for binary f s k. What about the detection part? So, it is both possible to have a coherent detection and non-coherent detection of binary f s k. First, let us talk about the coherent detection part. So, the coherent detector is just the inverse logically the received signal is divided into two parts. The first part is multiplied by cosine 2 pi f c t and second one from sine 2 pi f c t integrate add pass it through a decision circuit and get an output. Why are we multiplying this? Look at the f s k waveform and we have this 2 pi f c t being split here, multiplied, integrated and a decision circuit has been passed through. Let us talk about the non-coherent detection. This is the block diagram for non-coherent detection of binary f s k. Here on the left is the f s k input, again you split it into two parts, but this time we have logically a band pass filter at lower frequency and a matched band pass filter at higher frequency. F subscript L stands for the lower frequency part and F subscript H stands for the higher frequency part. Clearly we have two frequencies, one of the frequencies representing 0, the higher frequency representing 1. Once you pass it through, pass it through an envelope detector. So, there is no need to know the carrier. This is non-coherent detection, add it up, pass it through a decision circuit. So, please note that the two symbols 1 and 0 pertain to the cos 2 pi f l t and cos 2 pi f h t pertaining to the lower frequency and the higher frequency. Now, how does the f s k spectrum look like? Please remember, this is also an important part in choosing a modulation technique. How does the spectrum look like? Where are the main lobes ending? How high are the side lobes? What are the locations of the nulls? These are the questions that have to be addressed before we choose any particular modulation technique. So, for f s k, very simplistically, if you are using binary f s k, you have one concentration of a main lobe here at omega 1 pertaining to frequency 1 and 1 at omega 0. The spacing omega 1 minus omega 0 is 2 delta omega. It is called the frequency shift, frequency shift from an apparent carrier. So, if you pass your f s k spectrum through a non-intelligent detector and decoder and ask it to determine 
the carrier frequency, it might mistakenly give you this center point as the carrier frequency. So, this is called the apparent carrier frequency. So, when you have to specify any FSK modulator or demodulator, you specify in terms of the center frequency, the phase shift and the frequency bandwidth of F 1 and F 2. Now, let us shift gears and move into something called as minimum shift keying. What is minimum shift keying? It is a special type of continuous phase FSK. So, we have entered the domain of continuous phase modulation techniques and we will stay there. The modulation index for minimum shift keying is 0.5. How do you define a modulation index for the case of FSK? Well, it is given by K subscript FSK equal to 2 delta F over R b, delta f is the frequency separation, R b is the bit rate. So, minimum shift keying has the property that the modulation index is 0.5. The other important characteristics of minimum shift keying are constant envelope, highly desirable, works well for relay fading environments, good spectral efficiency, we will find out how good is it in the subsequent slides. Good bit error rate performance, it is scoring high on all of these things, spectral efficiency, bit error rate performance, continuous phase. No doubt, MSK is one of the popular modulation techniques. It also has a self synchronizing capability. So, let us now go deeper into minimum shift keying. Just one more point, minimum shift keying is also called fast FSK. Why? Because the frequency spacing used is only half as much as that used in a conventional non-coherent FSK. We are talking about the frequency shift between F 1 and F 2, the two frequencies used to denote 1 and 0. Let us see how we can represent an MSK signal. So, let us say S t can be represented as S 1 phi 1 t plus S 2 phi 2 t, where t lies between 0 and the bit interval t b. Now, what are phi 1s and phi 2s? Phi 1 for MSK is given by under root 2 over t b cosine pi over 2 t b t times cosine 2 pi f c t and it lasts from minus t b to t b. But please note phi 2 is shifted in time. It is under root 2 over t b sin of pi over 2 t b t sin 2 pi f c t, but please note this time is from 0 to 2 t b. Please note there is a time shift between phi 1 and phi 2. In some sense, we can equate it to offset QPSK. In fact, in offset QPSK, we use rectangular pulses shifted by T b by 2. Here, instead of rectangular pulses, you are using the half cycle of cosine. Other than that, it is very similar to your offset QPSK. So, here is phi 1 and here is the phi 2 that will plug in and multiply to get your ST. Please note this method of representation of an MSK signal will lead to how you build the modulator and then the demodulator. We will have a simple multiplication of cos 2 pi f c t with cos pi over t b t to begin with to create the basis functions. right? And then you create this s of t, multiply it with message bits and send it out. Here is a simple representation in the time domain. The first figure shows 
the time uh, domain input binary sequence. So, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Suppose this is an example we are taking. When you use the previous slide to find out phi 1 and phi 2 and multiply it, you get this kind of a waveform for S1 phi 1 t and clearly a time shifted S2 phi 2 t. When you add it up, magically you reach a continuous wave FSK. Please note that the places where there is a 1, there is a higher frequency and the moment you enter the domain of 0, correspondingly there is a lower frequency and then again higher frequency and then lower frequencies. Right. So, this is how MSK works. It is spectrally one of the most efficient continuous phase modulation techniques. Now, let us use our understanding of the MSK signals and build a transmitter. We first start with cos 2 pi f c t and multiply with what cos pi t over t b. These were the two things we multiplied with. If you remember phi 1 t is cos pi over t b t cos 2 pi f c t and we multiply it. Here is what you get. And so, this is how we are trying to build our phi 1. Pass it through the binary uh, sorry the band pass filter centered around f 1, pass this one through the filter centered around f 2. So, these are narrow band pass filters, add it up and you get your phi 1 and phi 2. Now, all you have to do is multiply by m 1 and m 2 t and send out the m s k waveform. So, this is a simple transmitter for m f s k. Now, how does the m s k receiver look like? It is just the reverse. You again start with your phi 1 and phi 2 t which you can generate locally. Take the input, split it up, multiply it, integrate it, pass it through the decision device, estimate the phase logic circuit and find out the binary output waveform. So, this is the MSK receiver, it is fairly easy to construct. Now, the other aspect is what is the power spectral density of an MSK. For MSK, the baseband pulse shaping function is given by P t, which is nothing but cos pi t over 2 capital T and it is 0 elsewhere. In this case, if you use this pulse shaping function, then you have the power spectral density of MSK given by the following equation. Please note, it is here F plus F c and here F minus F c and the denominators are same. So, there is a symmetry around F c. How does it look like? Only on the positive side here is your MSK and to compare it with we have the power spectral density in the background for the QPSK or also the offset QPSK which has a similar power spectral density. So, couple of things that can be noted. Please note this is the x axis representing frequency and y axis is in dB. The first thing that we observe is that the main lobe of your MSK is broader than QPSK or offset QPSK, which means it requires a little bit more bandwidth. But this comes at an advantage. The advantage is that the side lobes are greatly reduced. When I say greatly, please note that the y axis is in dB. So, here th there is almost a 20 dB reduction with respect to the first side lobe of QPSK, which means most of the energy is present 
in the main lobe. And usually the bandwidth is measured with respect to the main lobe only. So, it is a good property. So, for your MSK, the power spectral density is fairly conducive. Now, what are the advantages of MSK over binary FSK? See, both MSK and binary FSK produce constant envelope carrier signals with absolutely no amplitude variations. This is a desirable characteristic for improving the power efficiency of the transmitters. You can use the class C amplifiers. The amplitude variations can exercise non-linearities in an amplifier's amplitude transfer function. What does it do? It generates spectral regrowth, a component of the adjacent channel power. Therefore, more efficient amplifiers, which tend to be less linear, can be used with constant envelope signals reducing power consumption. Now, let us look at one variant of MSK called the Gaussian MSK. This is popular because it has been adopted by the GSM standard also. So, how does it differ from MSK? GMSK is a simple binary modulation scheme. Okay. The beauty is in its simplicity. It is a derivative of MSK, we will soon see. And how is it derived from MSK? The side lobe levels of the spectrum are further reduced which spectrum? The spectrum of the MSK are further reduced by passing the modulating non-return to zero data waveform through a Gaussian pulse shaping filter. So, you first pass the waveform, data waveform through a Gaussian pulse shaping filter and then use the MSK. It will clearly give you better spectral properties because you are doing pulse shaping. Because, but we will see that the price is not too much. Gaussian baseband pulse shaping smooths the phase trajectory of the MSK signal. Now, let us see how a GMSK transmitter looks like. So, the implementation is fairly simple you have a non return to 0 data 1 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 which is coming in. It is first passed through a Gaussian low pass filter which actually smooths the edges and what you obtain is B of T. Now, in this case your M is equal to 0.5. So, you use an FM modulation, it is a fairly evolved technology and then what you send out is Gaussian FSK. Please note the implementation is very simple and hence very inexpensive. You can also go the MSK route where the GMSK modulator uses the quadrature components to generate the quadrature GMSK. Again, you have the non return to 0 input E of t. First, you pass it through the Gaussian low pass filter. Now, the Gaussian low pass filter will also be characterized by a parameter called alpha, which decides how broad or narrow is the low pass filter, basically the role of factor that is a design parameter. Once you pass it, you get B t, you integrate it, split it, pass it through cos and sin filters, get x t's and y t's, multiplied by the local oscillator sum and send it. So, this is the simple implementation of quadrature Gaussian minimum shift key. Now, 
let us compare how does G M S K stand with respect to M S K. Now, here on the leftmost column is the product of time and bandwidth, the time bandwidth product given by B T. Here it denotes the different kinds of G M S K possible for the different role of factors alpha. This comes from the Gaussian filter. So, it is 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.5 right? and when it becomes very, very large, so infinity it becomes M S K. Right? So, here let us look at an example, how much power is contained within a certain bandwidth. So, if I want to take this example of M S K, what it means is that 99 percent of the power is contained within a bandwidth B equal to 1.2 divided by T or B T is equal to 1.2. It means for M S K 90 percent of the power is contained in a bandwidth equal to 0.78 divided by T and so and so, so you can become as stringent as possible. At the same time, please compare it with some of the G M S K schemes. Consider for example, 0 0.5 G M S K. If you use the same parameter, how much power of 0 0.5 G M S K is contained uh, within 1.04 by T of the bandwidth, the answer is 99 percent. So, clearly a much smaller band contains the same amount of power. If you choose to move further up and you have a more sharper roll of factor. So, if you look at 0 0.2 G M S K, then hardly 0 0.8 over T is the bandwidth requirement for 0 0.2 G M S K to contain 99 percent of the power. So, it is a very spectrally efficient schemes. This table gives you how much strict you want to be on the x axis and how lenient you want to be in terms of choosing your G M S K. So, in this slide you can also see that M S K is a special special case of G M S K. Now, let us get a better feel of power spectral density of G M S K. Please note that other than having analytical expression, a lot of simulations are carried out to determine the power spectral density of G M S K, because actually it depends upon what kind of data that you get. It is data dependent. So, you average out over a lot of data sequences and then come up with some kind of a power spectral density depiction for GMSK. So, the curves are not that smooth. Please note that the topmost curve corresponds to MSK, MSK where B T is equal to infinity and then you come down as you increase as you the product decreases from infinity to if you have 1, 0 0.7, 0 0.5 and so on and so forth up to 0 0.16 is depicted. This is the role of factor which we are talking about. So, as you decrease your alpha, you start packing in more power within the main lobe and you decrease the value of the side lobe. Please note that the y axis is in dB and the x axis is a normalized frequency given by f minus f c t. So, this diagram gives us some feel for the power spectral density. This also shows that your M S K is a special case of G M S K. Let us now consider how does a 
Gaussian minimum shift king receiver look like? Let us say you have a modulated IF input signal coming in, you pass it through a splitter, then you multiply it with um, a sine and a cosine, so pi by 2 shifted here, sine and cosine, this is a local oscillator. Please remember that the input signal has itself been taken through a clock recovery circuit and then generated the loop filtering and which will tell you where the phase of the local oscillator should be. Now, once you multiply, you pass it through low pass filters, do some kind of a thresholding, add and get the demodulated signal. So, exactly how you construct it, you take it apart. What are the advantages of GMSK over MSK? Clearly, spectral efficiency is an advantage we have already seen. What are the other advantages? GMSK is a derivative of MSK where the bandwidth required is further reduced. How? By passing the modulating waveform through a Gaussian filter. The Gaussian filter minimizes the instantaneous frequency variations over time. GMSK is a spectrally efficient modulation scheme and is particularly useful in mobile radio systems. It is a standard in GSM. It has a constant envelope, spectrally efficient, good BR performance and self-synchronizing. So, a lot of advantages of GMSK. Now, we shift gears and look at a combination of linear and constant envelope modulation techniques, basically a sneak preview on MPSK and then in the subsequent lectures, we will try to see how we deal with quadrature amplitude modulations etcetera and finally, the spread spectrum techniques. So, let us say the MRE signal set can be expressed as S MPSK in time domain under root E s, this denotes the energy per symbol cosine i minus 1 pi by 2 phi 1 t plus E s sin i minus 1 pi by 2 phi 2, where i goes from 1 to up to m because it is an emery signal set. So, I have 2 phi 1s and phi 2s and then we have this sinusoids. Since there are only two basis signals, the constellation of MRE PSK is two dimensional. The MRE message points are equally spaced on a circle of radius under root E s centered at the origin. So, if you increase the radius, you are actually pumping in more energy per symbol. And as you increase the radius, the separation between the points in the constellation diagram increases, giving you better signal to noise ratio. The probability of error, the average symbol error probability of a coherent MRE PSK system in additive white Gaussian noise or AWGN channel is given by the following equation. It is upper bounded by 2 Q function under root 2 E B log to the base 2 m over n naught sin pi over m. So, you can derive this equation, it is available in standard textbook, we are not going into the derivation, but it gives you a feel as how as you increase the m, your probability of error increases. The symbol error probability of a differential MRE PSK system in additive white Gaussian noise channel is given by 2 q under root 4 E s over n naught sin pi over 2 m. What is the performance of symbol error probability for different values of m? Here, let us see on the x axis, we have plotted E b over n naught, on the y axis is the symbol error rate and there are lot of curves these are called the waterfall curves because of the way they look 
and let us look at case 1 m is equal to 2. So, this is actually m is equal to 2 b p s k as you can see it up to 10 d b e b over n naught it goes to fairly low values 10 to the power minus 5 which is a an acceptable uh, performance region. The moment you go from 2 to 4 or 16, you have to have a higher E b over n naught to reach the same performance. So, now you are close to about 18 d b E b over n naught to reach the same performance level of 10 to the power minus 5. But clearly, since you have 16 m is equal to 16, you are sending 4 bits per symbol. If you are more greedy and go into 64, again for 64 you have to have an E b over n naught close to about 27 d b, so as to get the same performance of 10 to the power minus 5. So, there is a trade off between the bit rate and the probability of error. Now, let us spend some time looking at the power spectra of MRE PSK. The power spectral density PSD of an MRE PSK signal with rectangular pulses is given by this following equation. So, you have this sink squared terms here centered around F c and if you write E s in terms of E b log to the base 2 m, then you get the following expression. The symbol duration T s of an M R E P S K signal is related to the bit duration T b by T s is equal to T b log to the base 2 m. In this slide, we have plotted the power spectral density for two cases m is equal to 8 and m is equal to 16. Here again with m is equal to 8 and raise cosine filter alpha is equal to 0 0.5 brings it down lower and again m is equal to 16 raise cosine filter alpha is equal to 0 0.5 it brings it down lower. So, what is what can be learned from this slide is that the power spectral density looks as follows. This is in d b scale, therefore, the sink functions look much more rounded and the m is equal to 16 case is spread out, m is equal to 8 case is a little narrower in the spectral content. Please note they are both centered around f c. power efficiency and bandwidth efficiency of an MSK signal. So, let us look at the constellation diagram, where you have m is equal to 2 scenario, m is equal to 4 q p s k, 8 p s k and 16 p s k. Now, if you have not increased the radius of the circle, which is under root e f s, then as you are packing in more and more number of symbols on the circumference of the circle they tend to get closer and the probability of error will go up. But in this slide, we are talking about the bandwidth efficiency. Let us look at this table. Here on the first row, we have put down the numbers m is equal to 2, 4, 8 etcetera for the m p s k. Second row denotes the eta b which is the efficiency bandwidth given by r b over b star. What is b star? b star is the bandwidth measured between the first null bandwidth of m r e p s k signals. So, clearly as you increase from m is equal to 2 to 4 and then to 8 and so forth, gradually your r b over b star increases. So, bandwidth requirement increases, but R b increases much faster. So, therefore, you can see a general increase. In the previous slide, if you see, 
the first nulls are different. So, the first null bandwidth is different from for m is equal to 8 and m is equal to 16. However, the r b also increases leading it to a larger value of eta b. The third row plots for a particular bit error rate. Here we are taking 10 to the power minus 6 the E b over n naught requirement. As we saw in the waterfall slides earlier for the same bit error rate, you need to increase the E b over n naught as you increase your m. So, here is a plot of how your requirement for E b over n naught increases. So, clearly there is a trade off. If you are working in a low SNR scenario, then you have to resort to a smaller value of m, but the price you pay is poorer efficiency. If you are lucky enough to have very good SNRs between 25 to 30 dB, you can easily choose somewhere between m is equal to 32 and 64. So, couple of comments on power efficiency and bandwidth efficiency. Increasing m implies that the constellation is more densely packed as seen before and hence the power efficiency or noise tolerance is decreased. This is intuitive, but the bandwidth efficiency perspective is different. The first null bandwidth of MRE PSK signals decrease as m increases while RB is held constant. Therefore, as the value of m increases, the bandwidth efficiency also increases. Let us now summarize today's lecture. We took a look at constant envelope modulation techniques. Specifically, we talked about binary FSK or binary frequency shift keying. We then graduated to another technique called minimum shift keying, which is spectrally more efficient. A derivative of minimum shift keying called the Gaussian minimum shift keying was studied next. Finally, we took a look at MRE PSK and its power spectrum. We will conclude our lecture here and in the subsequent lectures, we will talk about quadrature amplitude modulation and also spread spectrum techniques. Thank you.